So I'm going to turn this on. It, uh, these badges are freaking awesome. Can we get a hand for the people that designed yes. these? And uh, they go to 11. I don't know if everybody noticed that, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and set mine to 11 because, yeah, anyway. So, hey, uh, we're going to talk. Uh, this Anybody that was in the room for the previous talk, which was awesome and intense and very personal, uh, this talk is not that. This is going to be uh, a lighter look a little bit at uh, why you might not want to be a CISO, or might you, why you might want to. Um, so, uh, just real quick, because I really don't want to make this about me, but this is me, same guy except older and fatter, which is what happens over time. Um, I've been doing IT for over 25 years. Uh, I'm the CISO at H&R Block here in town. This talk is not about H&R Block. Uh, this is about my experience uh, in my career. Uh, and I, I get a lot of questions from people about, uh, you know, in mentoring relationships and things like that about, okay, well, how do I take the next step in my career? And by and large, um, people have terrible ideas about what a CISO actually does and why they might want to be one. So uh, we're going to ask, uh, ask and answer three big questions today. First, what the hell's wrong with you? Why would you want to do this? Second, um, what are you good at, right? Does it match any of the things that an average CISO might actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we're gonna circle back, like why are you here? Why are you in this room right now? Because if you're in this room, I'm, I'm expecting it's because it, either you're lost uh, or you're bored, uh, you might have fallen asleep or maybe you actually wanna become CISO and we'll see if there's any good matches there. So, let's start here. Um, what's wrong with you? whatever reasons you may have for thinking you might want to be a CISO are likely really bad ones. Um, this is largely due to the fact that most people don't actually understand what a CISO does. Uh, I was one of those people for a long time. Um, remember, I, you know, I think we tend to forget because we're in the weeds so much every day uh, in our careers that InfoSec is a pretty young practice. You know, it sprouted out of, out of IT, uh, but we haven't been around that long. And you know, we understand InfoSec infinitely better than people that aren't in InfoSec understand it, right? Our peers, our colleagues at work. Um, and you think about, you know, degree programs in InfoSec, that's super new. Like, when I went to school, which was admittedly a while back, like, that was not an option. Like, even, like, a computer science degree just meant you learned Pascal or some nonsense like that. So, let's look at some of the worst possible reasons that you might want to become a CISO. See if any of these resonate with you. Money? I like money. Do you like money? We should hang out. Um, you know, the, and this, this, is, this is one of those, that, like if your goal is money, there's lots of careers where you can make a lot of money. Um, as kind of the pinnacle uh, position, because it's got the C in front of it, whether you're talking about a CSO or a CISO, that's gonna be one of the highest paid positions in our industry, fair. Um, Salary.com says right now, Average CISO base salary is between 180 and 300. Uh, Glassdoor says, shockingly, 97 to 240. Uh, Payscale says 110 to 230. Um, in comparison, like data scientists average 150, and they don't have to put up with half the bullshit that a CISO does. Guarantee it. Um, there's a lot of really hot uh, areas that are having explosive growth in IT, right? So, uh, machine learning, AI, blockchain developers, things like that. Money is great really, uh, it, unless you don't have the time to enjoy it. 88% um, of CISOs, I read this, this interesting report out of the UK called uh, uh, Life Inside the Perimeter, I think is what it was called. And it was supposed to help people understand the modern CISO, whatever that means, uh, because 20 years ago there wasn't a non-modern CISO. Um, but 88% of CISOs say they do way more than the 40 hours a week, closer to 60 hours and that they rarely disconnect, and that's absolutely true. The other 12% are lying, or they're golfing until they get fired. Uh, what about power, right? I have the power. CISOs have to be master influencers to be successful in their roles. But that doesn't equate to power. Most other executives are gonna view what you do with suspicion or even hostility, because what you do is placing responsibilities and burdens, not to mention costs, on their team. Your priorities are not their priorities. Um, and so, you know, 
while you own the outcomes of the security problems at your company and those challenges, um, you've got to bring people along with you. So this is one of those cases where CISO title, you have the role, you have the responsibility, you may not have the actual power to affect change directly. You can't dictate it and make it happen. How about boredom? Like, I've done all the things. I've hacked all the things. What do I do next? Um, being a CISO will definitely lead you to the opposite of boredom. If you think you've done it all, you want a new challenge, uh, you will definitely get it. But I think you'll definitely get that in InfoSec anyway. Um, you know, going back to that survey that I mentioned earlier, 25% of the CISO survey thought that the job has an impact on their mental or physical health, or both, uh, as well as their personal and family relationships. Uh, and 17% of CISOs admitted that they're either medicating using alcohol or drugs to deal with their job stress. For those of you who were in the room for the last talk, this is a very common thing. We know that alcohol is very prevalent, uh, drugs very prevalent in, in InfoSec. Um, I think 17% is low. I think most people probably uh, medicate, self-medicate. So uh, what about, like, I'm overqualified. I can't fit any more certifications on my business card. Um, surprisingly, while the CISO role is kind of the pinnacle of InfoSec jobs, um, the technical responsibilities of a CISO are far less important than the soft skills, your ability to talk with and connect with other people. So you may have done all the things and gotten all the certifications, that's awesome. Um, I was on that track for a long time too. But if you don't know how to talk to people, uh, if you don't have a clue about how business actually works, specifically the business that you're supposed to be leading the security efforts for, um, or you aren't great or you don't love building a team, like you don't like that aspect, you don't like vendor management, uh, you don't like budget management, um, this might not be the right path for you. So, anybody here played Exploding Kittens before? Yeah, Pope of Nope is here to tell you, nope, terrible reasons. All of those were terrible, terrible reasons. Um, there are other terrible reasons, too numerous to mention. Now, I only have 20 minutes, so I'm not gonna try, but you know, uh, if you love playing technology, guess what? I haven't put my hands on a keyboard for a while. Um, you gotta let go of that. Uh, if you like spending other people's money, also a terrible reason. Uh, it's fun, but it's not a great reason to be a CISO. Stress and burnout are the top risks for a CISO, not job loss as a result of a breach. A lot of people think with the, uh, the average tenure of a CISO being about two and a half years, it's because there's a breach and they need a head and it's yours and it rolls and you go on to the next thing. Actually, it's job burnout and stress that causes most of the churn. So let's try a different, different angle here. Instead of looking at uh, bad reasons for becoming CISO. Let's look at some of the things that CISO actually actually does. Um, let's see if any of this resonates with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about four main things, four main categories of things where a CISO spends most of their time. And again, your mileage may vary. This could be very dependent on the size of the organization, whether you're in a heavy regulated industry, uh, etc. But uh, four areas. So a CISO strategizes. Um, because you own all the security outcomes, even for the things that you don't directly control. Uh, you influence others. In other words, if I need something from the app dev team, I gotta go convince the app dev boss to put my stuff on their backlog, and that means product features are gonna have to come out or get deprioritized. Uh, recruiting talent. We've all been through uh, a significant change in the way we recruit talent and the way uh, people are actually willing to work under what conditions and how. So this is a big aspect now. I lost uh, about 60% of my domestic team over the last year in turnover and churn. Uh, and finally, uh, reporting. So metrics, uh, but also just verbally reporting up, reporting to the board, reporting to the CEO or the CFO, uh, the rest of the executive team. So let's dig in a little bit. First, Strategery. So the vision is all you. You are responsible for developing, executing, and owning the outcomes of a comprehensive security strategy. So this includes a bunch of different stuff. Uh, development and adoption of a comprehensive risk management program. Uh, development and enhancement of policies, standards, procedures. Uh, you know, all, whoop, not that. Um, you know, all of the things that would guide the activities undertaken inside the organization. 
uh, mechanisms to enforce the security controls, detect when they're missed, track them to compliance, uh, identifying the likely threats to the organization, so reading into the threat intelligence, reading the landscape, being able to report up to the board, here's what we think the big rocks are going to be in the next year, and here's where we may need to make some targeted investments. Um, even basic things like end-user security awareness training and testing, right? You're going to have a say in that, how it's done, how often it's done, who gets it. You're going to have to have a strong sense of when this happens because you're going to have people, let's say you work for a sales organization, every time the salesperson fails your phishing test, what, what's going to happen, right? They're going to complain to their boss, their boss is going to complain up, and eventually they're going to say, hey, why are you wasting my time with this? I'm trying to ge generate revenue for the company. You'll have to align security solutions with business goals. So this is back to that idea of understanding deeply how the business actual fu actually functions. You'll find the C in the CISO is way more important than the next three letters. Uh, and maintaining compliance with regulations, frameworks, contractual requirements, all that kind of stuff. Um, you'll have to manage a budget, and if you're in a Fortune 500 or Fortune 50, it's probably a pretty good sized budget. Um, you will be responsible for the outcomes that are driven by the money that you spend and the investments you make. So again, great power comes great responsibility sort of thing. You are responsible for all security outcomes. This is why many CISOs drink and don't sleep very well. Um, especially when you start realizing, again, you don't directly control most of the functions that lead to those outcomes. So the influence aspect is massive. You're still accountable. <coughs> So, how do you influence? You have the title, you have the accountability, and as I mentioned multiple times, what you don't have is the control. So a lot of what you're going to want to do and need to do involves the ability to influence others. So to influence others outside of InfoSec, much less outside of IT, you need to have a deep understanding of the business and you have to speak the language of the people that you have to influence, which means you have to know and care about the things that they know and care about. You can't expect to drag them to you or you, you're going to just reinforce the idea that security is the place where good ideas go to die. Everything you do has a cost, right? There's personal capital, there's hard cash capital, but the convincing of others, that's really where this all kind of hinges, is if you cannot walk into a room of people who have no idea how the technology works, no idea how to measure risk, no idea what success looks like, except they don't want to see their name in the Wall Street Journal, you're going to have a bad day of it. So I've given a couple talks lately on building high-performing teams, recruiting and retaining talent. Building a high-performing connected team is the most critical aspect of running an effective security program. We talk a lot about people, process, and technology, right? People are the most important piece of that. That's why they go first. Finding the right people is of paramount importance. So given the global shortage of talent in InfoSec, uh, around 750, 850,000 openings in the US, about three and a half million globally, it's incumbent on the CISO, the people leader, to help solve this long-term talent problem by investing in training, investing in mentoring, investing in young talent pipelines. Young talent doesn't necessarily mean I'm 21 years old and I'm graduating with my first InfoSec degree and I have no clue what I'm doing. It may mean, hey, I'm a mom entering the workforce after my kids have just gone off to college for the first time. I am a law enforcement professional who wants to try something different. I've got uh, on my team you know, former law enforcement, former military, former healthcare, former attorneys. Pull from wherever you can, because what you're looking for, <laughs> I say this and, and people generally laugh um, at me, but I'm looking for people that are smarter than me and that aren't sociopaths. And that's everything else you can train, right? You can't teach people to be good humans. You need to find that piece, have the right mindset, the right curiosity, the right drive. Everything else can be taught. You also need great communicators. Uh, you need T-shaped engineers, we call them a block, right? So they're broad across a variety of topics and they go super deep in their one area of expertise. You need a team that's gonna rumble vulnerably. In other words, they're gonna open themselves up. They're gonna advocate for the things they're passionate about. Um, you know, when you're trying to figure out the best strategy together. 
but ultimately, even if it doesn't go their way, they're going to get behind the solution and everybody's going to pull in the same direction. Um, the other bit that's really tough here is it's not always uh, you know, sunshine and rainbows. Um, you're going to have to identify and aggressively address sources of unhappiness, uh, frustration, and negativity before they spread. So uh, if somebody's unhappy about something, you've got to do everything in your power to try and make it right. But if it's ultimately not a good fit for that person in your organization, you need to help them find the next thing. If you leave people in who are, uh, whatever you want to call it, quiet quitting, uh, that negativity spreads and it's going to cut down the efficacy and the cohesiveness of your team. Finally, you know, measuring what matters is a big piece. Um, metrics should drive everything we do. We should act on fact-based engineering, not gut feel. So if I'm providing services to the business, just like any other function that gets provided to the business, if it's a critical function to help the business succeed, it needs to be measurable, which means you need to apply rigor and fact-based decision-making to everything you do. You gotta keep the board apprised of the status, uh, challenges, opportunities, you got to filter out the noise and the FUD and just show, here's what's working, here's what isn't. That's right, you got to be completely transparent about the stuff you do that absolutely doesn't work and is not worth it further investing. Um, you know, and the, the really interesting thing I've found in the last few years especially is that there's a massive difference between operational metrics that help your team know where to pivot and apply force and effort uh, and the kind of uh, metrics that the board is going to care about. Uh, again, there are going to be non-technical. Most of your other executives are going to be almost completely non-technical, but they still need to understand the impact you have to the business. Um, SLA adherence, for example. So, I'm almost out of time. So let's circle all the way back to where we started, right, about uh, why are you here, right? You remember? And Pepperidge Farm remembers. Some of you ostensibly wanted to become a CISO, or at least were curious about the topic. So what are some actual good reasons, from my perspective, about why you might want to be a CISO and do things that a CISO does? Maybe you feel a deep connection to your work, right? You want your work to have a purpose over time. You want to build a legacy, something that outlasts you, that will serve your business, serve uh, you know, wherever you are working. That's a great reason, right? Being a CISO gives you the opportunity to plant seeds for all the Hamilton fans out there, for a garden that you never get to eat the fruits of. Um, we all know there's not an end point in what we do. It's a program, it's a process, and it's going to keep on going, hopefully. Um, another good reason, right? You want to help solve the talent crisis. I, I believe this is one of my strongest ambitions right now, and I believe it is incumbent on all of us as leaders in the cybersecurity space to help solve the talent problem. Mentor people, guide people, Go out to high schools, go out to local organizations, teach them about security, bring new talent in. Uh, maybe you want to be an agent of change and help solve tough multiple dis multidisciplinary problems, like being able to speak clearly. Uh, no, seriously, it, you know, the, the topic that was before me about neurodiversity, like neurodiversity is a superpower for InfoSec departments. The more different lenses you get looking at tough problems, the better your odds are going to be to solve those problems. If everybody in your team looks and thinks like me, it's not going to go well for you. You need a well-rounded team with lots of different backgrounds. Um, maybe you want to continue learning not just about your own swim lanes, but about all of the wider business. I guarantee you, the CISO has to work harder than almost any other executive to understand the business because what we do often, unless you work for a cybersecurity company, doesn't directly drive revenue. It's an enabler. It's a protector for the business. And so you will have to learn deeply because of all the reasons I gave earlier in terms of influencing your peers and getting the things you want actually done. And also, hey, maybe you're an evil mastermind with world domination plans. Who am I to judge? But this is a great place to start if that's what you want. So on that note, thank you. Um, I'll put that up. And uh, anybody have any questions? Yeah. What security domains do you find that I've heard of what the end of the candidate experience help kind of diversify your skill set compared to better being a civil worker? Yeah, so the question is uh, what security companies could you work for, intern with, study with to help 
round out your skill set and make you a better overall practitioner. Is that right? Oh, security domains. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as a CISO, you're not going to be hands on keyboard unless you're working on a PowerPoint or an Excel, pretty much, um, or a board memo. Um, just the way it is, right? Now, by the time you get to this place, you probably gave up a lot of those things anyway. Um, so it's not as much about um, technical skills, but you do have to have broad awareness over regulatory space. Um, you have to have, you know, I, I think getting a, a business degree is actually pretty useful uh, because it helps you understand a lot of the nuts and bolts of what's going, what's going along behind the scenes. Um, you know, the kind of stuff that you would study for uh, when you take your CISSP, right, those domains, they're all important. You're going to have to be conversant in those topics, but you don't have to be the expert of how you actually address and fix those issues, right? That's why you hire people smarter than you to do the actual, you know, cyber securing, if that helps. Yeah. Hi. You mentioned uh, earlier that uh, you personally had like a 60% cut in your in your talent. Uh, uh, I, I, I was just, uh, from your perspective, do you think this this like post pandemic like like hyper competitive nature is like here to stay? Like, do you think these remote jobs are always going to be like like poaching talent? And what? How's it going to shake out? Yeah, the question is, you know, the the kind of stuff we saw in the Great Resignation. Is this, is this the new normal? Is this, you know, is the remote work here to stay? Are we gonna keep seeing the poaching? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because we saw it acutely during the Great Resignation in a, in a much larger fashion. And we saw it across, obviously not just in cybersecurity, we saw it across the board, right? Um, I don't think it's something new. I think it was just the magnitude of it that was new. But as long as we have 800,000 open positions or whatever it is, um, you know, you, there's going to be a lot of competition that's going to keep pushing wages up. Um, I think companies that don't get on board with the flexibility of work arrangements, that they don't recognize that the kind of nonsense that companies used to force people to do, you have to be here nine to five, you're always on call, things like that. Um, people just aren't going to, the, the new workers are not going to put up with that kind of nonsense. And so if you're working for a company that has those kind of rigid mindsets around what makes for good work, uh, yeah, you're going to struggle. Um, you know, we, so Block used to not really hire people remotely. It used to be just Kansas City. It's a mid-market city. There's a lot of talent, but in some areas there's not a lot of depth of talent. So you have the same few companies competing over the same talent locally, right? Um, when we opened up and started recruiting nationwide, it was way easier to get talent. Um, it's harder to make a team cohesive. You have to go the extra steps, right, to do that. So. Uh, that's a very long answer for me to say, yeah, I think it's here to stay. Until we can close the, uh, the gap of, of open positions, we're going to see churn. Um, but that's something we're all going to have to address together. Cool. Thank you. Yeah? So in your quest for talent, aside from uh, non-sociopaths and smarter than you, what are your key factors that you look for when hiring people? Yeah, so the question was, uh, when I'm looking for people smarter than me that aren't sociopaths, how do I assess that out? What are the key factors and talent that I look for? Um, I really don't do any technical interviewing anymore. I only do behavioral interviewing. We ask a lot of questions around um, what's the toughest problem you've had to solve where you failed, uh, and how did you approach that? How do you, how do you lead through failure? So if it's a, a people leadership, we'll talk a lot about how do you deal with problem situations, and we'll give them specific situations. Um, for the technical folks, I let the engineers do it first, and then I'll do a fit for purpose kind of interview with them. Um, you know, I, I have nothing against certifications. I used to have a lot of them that I maintained. I don't anymore. Um, I think it's great. I think the needs vary widely depending on the size of your team, the areas you're recruiting for. Um, but I also think that it's incumbent on all of us to keep a pipeline of young talent uh, you know, whether it's an internship program or uh, Block has something called Accelerate, where we bring in a cohort of like 40 associate software and security engineers at the same time, and they move through that cohort together. Given the amount of churn, you're gonna, if you don't want to be constantly rebuilding your team and suffering those kind of setbacks, you have to have that, that continuous flow of talent coming in. 
Anyone else? Yes? So I thought it was funny that you mentioned like the 21-year-old about to graduate. Like, for that person, what would you say? Do you have any like, advice beyond like, potentially looking at service, like looking around the Yeah, so the question is for the, uh, you know, the 21, 22-year-old that's just getting ready to graduate, maybe with a cybersecurity degree, first real job, what, what's my advice? Um, It's a great question. Uh, you know, I would say don't specialize too quickly because you're likely going to find multiple things that you haven't been exposed to in any depth yet that will drive where you may want to end up and find your most happiness. Uh, so be perfectly comfortable trying a bunch of different stuff. Um, go to conferences, explore, sit in talks that you think, I have no idea what this is about, right? Um, I would also say learn a programming language. Uh, that's one of the most important things. So to answer the technical skill question from just a minute ago, I love I love seeing people with programming languages because everything is code. Um, also, like just read, 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 read books, read all sorts of books, not just technical books. Like I look for people that are well-rounded individuals, just in terms of. And this is one of my own conceits because I don't have a technical degree. I was working on a PhD in philosophy when I switched to tech. So. Uh, wide background, lots of different interests, uh, lots of passions, those are the sort of things I look for. And internships are great. Anybody else? All right, thank you all so much for the time.